I don't know. Mm. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Taste of Art. We're going to let everyone um, give a few minutes for folks to trickle in. Excited to have you all join us tonight. Always feel like I should be playing some kind of music in the background. <laughs> As we get through this awkward waiting period. Let's see how the numbers look. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, since it's getting cloudy here, and I don't want a thunderstorm to interrupt our, our tasting. Um, so welcome everybody to VMFA Fridays After Five, A Taste of Art, uh, presented by Chase. Uh, tonight we're focusing and welcoming a Reason Beer um, joining us, a brewery from Charlottesville. And with us from Reason, we have Mark Fulton, head brewer and director of operations, and Patrick Adair, director of sales and marketing. Hi, guys. Hello. Hey, how are you? Thanks, Thanks to see you. Uh, and my name is Celeste Feta. I'm director of education at BMFA. If this is your first time uh, with uh, joining us for Taste of Art, or you come regularly, um, you know the next thing I'm going to talk about is how this works. Um, so this is a Zoom webinar, which means that we can not see you, but you can see us. And I always say use that to your advantage as you like. Um, if you are pairing beer with us this evening, our recommendation is to open that beer um, one by one as that beer is introduced and pouring it into a clear glass so we can talk about what the beer looks like as well as smells like and tastes like. Um, along the way tonight, we're gonna be asking for your impressions of the beer and the art selections that we're going to be pairing with the beer. Um, if you feel comfortable sharing those impressions or if you have a question, we encourage you to use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, and just the chat feature. Don't pop over to the Q&A. We're not going to see it. Uh, we're really just focusing on that chat box. Um, so all of us have that open and um, we will try to answer your questions and respond to your observations live um, in our discussion. If we don't get to something right away, just bear with us. We're, we'll scroll in down and, and we'll, we'll catch you uh, when we can. So that is how tonight is going to work. Um, we'll, we'll be tasting each bear, obviously, individually, um, talk about it, and then talk about a work of art that goes with it, um, and do that for each of the three selections that we have tonight. So um, to kick things off, I'm going to actually turn it right over uh, to Mark and Patrick, and uh, they're going to tell us about you know, how their brewery came to be, where they're located, and a little bit um, more about, you know, how they started, any other tidbits that come along or, or questions that you may have. Um, so I will move on to the first slide and, and turn it over. Cool. Go for it, man. Yeah. Uh, so uh, recent beer started as an idea that the, the two of us had, uh, gosh, going on almost 10 years ago. Um, Mark had been working as a professional brewer and been thinking about coming back home to Virginia and wanted to start something of his own. And uh, he, he reached out to me and we started kicking around some ideas about what a brewery in Virginia could look like at that point. Um, you know, Mark had had some experience as a, uh, as a home brewer and then a professional brewer. I'd had some experience as a home brewer. And we really were thinking about a brewery that could, could be something that was a little different than what else was out there. Um, something that we could, you know, kind of develop our own style, our own uh, you know, take on beer. And, um, you know, Mark, Mark really honed in on, on a couple beers in particular um, that were so, so distinct, I think, in that point. And we kind of jumped on that and, and ran with it. 
and um, you know, that ended up being our, our Hoppy Blonde, which was our, our first beer that we released. Um, you know, one of my favorite beers, and, and kind of the the recipe that launched Reason Beer. Absolutely. Yeah. No. We 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 always wanted to. We we, we are our beer fans, and we we together got into craft beer. Um, where uh, Patrick and myself and our other partner Jeff, we all grew up together in Charlottesville. Um, and we, we sort of got into craft beer and like the college sort of post college time, uh, early 2000s for us. And uh, um, yeah, we always like to, the beers that we enjoyed the most were the ones that we thought were the most interesting, but not overwhelming. So to try to find a way to take sort of the flavor profiles of craft beer and, uh, and present them in a way that um, was more complementary to to uh, food pairings in particular, and apparently art pairings as well, which we're learning about today. Um, <laughs> very exciting, and uh, and yeah, and uh, Javi Blan uh, to go um, more on what uh, what Patrick said is was kind of the concept a, a beer that that I had been working on kind of on my own um, and something that we thought sort of hit all of the uh, all of the check marks in terms of like big like flavor but reserved uh interesting but also like quaffable um yeah uh, and that that was sort of the the thought process that we put forth when we put the, the company together this is coming up on four years open which is crazy mm. to me so. so um can you tell us a little bit about how, how the name came to be like why why you landed on on reason um, as the name of the brewery and, and a little bit about kind of your logo that we see in the back wall here. Is this um, kind of where it all happens yeah. <laughs> behind the scenes? Yeah, that's so, the production floor itself. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're looking at the, the sort of heart of our operations uh, in our facility up on the Seminole Trail. Um, the logo and the name, I, I think, go together in a certain way. Um, we, we went around the block several times about what we wanted to say with our brewery, what the message of our brewery ought to be. And we kept coming back to the idea that we, we wanted to always focus first and foremost on the product itself. That we, we wanted to be a brewery that was about the quality of what we were making in our beers um, and that everything else would be secondary that you know the, the marketing the the design anything that we did that was ancillary to the beer itself would be um would be recognized as, as such and so we were we were talking through various forms of you know sort of ideology and philosophy and we started talking about um actually was um sort of 17th century um rhetoric and philosophy and, and the, the idea of natural philosophy. And we were going through these, uh, the, I think it was a dictionary at that point, and somebody yeah. just, somebody landed on the word reason and just said, wait, what if, what if we just called it reason? As though the, the beer is the reason and the reason is the beer and, and that's our brewery. And that discovery uh, made so much more clear for us. At that point, we could just say, okay, then if the name is reason and the reason is the beer, then our logo doesn't need to be anything more complicated than, than just, just an R that just references the name. And the, the labels can just be uh, something that identifies the brand in a very, very simple and straightforward way that, that makes room for all of the beautiful design and the recipe of the beer that Mark creates really come to the forefront. That's awesome. I mean, I, I think, so it's really kind of distilling it right to its core, um, right? Um, which I really, and again, will relate to the first work that we're going to talk about too. So uh, it's just perfect. Um, so you're in Charlottesville. Um, where can people find your beer if they're not coming to your, you know, uh, tasting room or buying it from VMFA? Where where else can they can they get it? Sure, you can find Reason Beer at uh, nearly every chain grocery store in Charlottesville and throughout Virginia. Um, at 
better bottle shops, at a liquor store, and anywhere you can find quality beer, you can find reason. Uh, and if you don't see it there, you know, please ask. They can always make sure to bring in some for you. Now, our, our distribution footprint at this point is statewide for Virginia alone, but we are looking hopefully in the coming months slash years to expand out uh, of the state into neighboring territories. Mm -hmm. okay, great. All right, so why don't we start tasting? Um, so you mentioned Hoppy Blonde a couple times, uh, kind of in your origin story. Um, and yep, I've got one here too. I'm gonna open mine. So, oop, R is backwards, sorry guys. Um, <laughs> So if you have um, the beer with you, um, like I mentioned kind of at the top, go ahead and pop that open because we're gonna start tasting the first selection. Um, you know, and in, in these tastings, you know, I always ask like, is there a, do you all have a preference on how you pour, recommend, like you all pour recommendations on pouring? I, I always say, uh, open it cold, pour it into your favorite glass. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, that works. Uh, if you're on the river or the beach, you can can. It's okay. You know, um, you might be missing part of the the point there, but uh, but believe me, it works. Um, yeah, God. I, every time, I mean, I, I, this is a beer that I, um, in terms of like recipe formulation, worked on, it, or iterated on more than anything probably all put together. Um, and a beer that's still, even when Patrick was pouring it just now, I could smell it and I was like, oh yeah, that, that is what I want. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, a uh, yeah, this beer is designed to, um, pair well with a lot of foods and, I mean, my, my mind up until today has always been on like, <laughs> uh, uh, food pairings, which is cool. Um, yeah, th this is always something that like, uh, something that you could drink and just enjoy or drink and be refreshing, but also is worth like putting in the, uh, a tulip and like really dissecting. Like mm -hmm. there's enough there that you really can dig into it, but there's not so much there that you can't just sort of drink and enjoy. You know, yeah. you don't, it doesn't demand that you put all of your attention into it. Uh, um, but on the other hand, it has enough uh, behind it to make it like worthy of attention. Yeah. And in the, um so i'm smelling like it's it's feel and and this is probably the hops that are coming through like that really spicy kind of intensity a little bit um so and in the description you talk about old and new world hops so could you talk explain a little bit about that difference and absolutely um so uh, this whole beer um is kind of a balancing act between classic uh European blonde ales and then sort of new school, I mean, frankly, West Coast IPA, which this is not, but um, the, the concept in, in the construction of this beer is to kind of draw from uh, both sort of traditional old world brewing methods, and that generally means European uh, mm -hmm. brewing methods, mm -hmm. and drawing from some of the modern advances that have been, that have come forth in uh, American craft brewing. Um, largely in the last 30 to 40 years, uh, as American craft brewing has sort of gained a foothold. Um, so, so in terms of an ingredients, uh, this beer is uh, from a malt base, um, is all entirely European. Uh, it's a blend of British and German uh, malts. Um, and then from a hops standpoint, it's a split between traditional German noble hops that are used in traditional like, German pilsners um, and then also a blend of those um, about half and half with kind of big American IPA hops. So um, I sort of found early on in the testing process of this that if you take some sort of the newer, you know, hip big IPA hops that we use uh, in IPAs here in the United States uh, and pair it down with traditional German noble hops, um, it actually does an interesting thing where you know, it sort of, it, it, this is not an IPA. It doesn't really come across as an IPA in any way, but you can take some of the high points of the big sort of citrus uh, explosion, big like massive West Coast sort of character uh, hop stuff and turn that, mix that in with uh, Noble Hops from Germany and you can sort of create almost a new concept or you, 
you end up taking the high points of the American hops and then fill them in with kind of the traditional roots of the German hops. Um, and it creates something that like, that I had not had in other beers before. Um, and in a beer like this, where it's uh, very pale and 4%, it's, you, you can't really hide behind a lot of, like it has to be balanced correctly. Like if it goes one way or the other too far bitter or too, more, too far malty, then it ruins the whole effect. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, why this beer works, at least from my point of view, um, is that it has all of those con like concepts together, blended in a way that like sort of harmonize and complement each other without overpowering each other or overpowering, you know, whatever you're pairing it with. Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, I usually don't like hoppy beer. I'll be real upfront. <laughs> But this is this this like doesn't smack me in the face, you know. Yeah. Um, and there is, and I know in the description too, and we've talked about the citrus in this. And man, I get it right at the end, like yeah. it's like a little zing note right at the end. So it just kind of it's it's a very refreshing refreshing beer. Um, and you, is this available kind of year round? Is this one of your staple beers? Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, um, we we do sometimes let it run out in the winter. Uh, just because it's, it, you know, it, it, it's a little bit tougher of a sell when it's cold and no one wants okay. to play beers. But uh, yes, it's a, it's a year round beer in our tasting room for sure. Um, and uh, actually, this year it seems to be picking up momentum, which is exciting because this is a beer yeah. that we uh, we got another a fresher route strike coming in a couple of weeks because uh, we sold all the things, so. <laughs> which is awesome. Um, That's good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, and, and that, that kind of citrus note is, uh, it's one of my very favorite hop varieties from the Pacific Northwest. It's uh, Amarillo, um, which interestingly was discovered wild in a cascade field um, and then cultivated from there. So the, the Amarillo hop was actually not cultivated in the same way that a lot of like newer big IPA hop varieties are, um, you know, sort of crossbred on purpose to create different flavors. This one was legitimately discovered in a field and it was so good they were like well we got to breed this one so one so is that what that's what's giving it kind of that citrus note yeah so Am amarillo okay. is obviously known for having like a pretty distinct like lemon like bright citrus okay. like not an orange less of an orange grapefruit citrus and more of a bright lemon sort of okay. lemon citrus. yeah that's cool um just a couple questions oh thanks mark mark answered the question where you're located in charlottesville just off of greenbrier on 29 north and then megan says love your beers can't wait to see the art pairings hoppy blonde is my favorite who is that that's nice thank you um so we were talking a little bit about um that citrusy note and i'm just kind of and of course the name blonde so i'm i'm taking a leap here and what and guessing that's why yellow is the predominant color on this uh design patrick if you if you want to give us some insight on that yeah i mean i, I don't know if i can add, answer that exactly and when i was going to to pick a color scheme for our initial labels i i just i just sort of tasted through our at that point our, our the four beers that we had we had we had a blonde we had a saison we had a pale and we had a black ipa and um it, it might be a little uh, a bit of synesthesia, but I, I would taste the beers and sort of, you know, feel a color. And to me, this beer just tastes yellow. And I, I really liked what Mark said about how he formulated the beer as a, as a way to sort of let the qualities of the beer come out without getting in their own way. And yeah. so I thought my assignment as the designer was to sort of put, put our, our, our brand front and center so that people recognize what it was, but then to just let an idea about the beer be what, what attracted a, a buyer to the can. And so thinking about the, the flavor that this beer tipped off in my head, this sort of bright, fun, yellow color came to mind. And I thought, if, if we put that color on the can, people will already know what it tastes like. Yeah. And see that on a shelf, they know what they're getting. Yeah. And I, I think, it, at least for, for my palate, it, it holds true. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree. Um, it's just... 
to me, like, it's like a zing. Like I, I keep saying that, like the yellow color on the, on the can is very zingy to me. And that's kind of the note I get right at that finish uh, with, the, with the beer. So I think it, it works really, really well. And um, if anyone else is tasting like along with us and wants to pop their oh, there in there, <laughs> uh, you're welcome to do that. Um, and you can pop those in there and I'll kind of uh, go ahead and bring up the art that we'll talk about with this one. Um, Mark, you talk all that. I'm waiting. Yes. We're trying to, as the sun goes down up here, we realize we probably should turn some lights on. <laughs> well, and I have to say again, I, I've thanked you all profusely, but just so everyone else knows, you all are in Pittsburgh right now. Um, so, you know, zooming in from another location, really, really appreciate it. Um, so the art that we're going to talk about with the Happy Blonde is this work by Donald Sultan, who's an American artist. Um, and it's called Lemons. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, again, thinking about, I, I, like, truthfully, I picked this work before I even saw the can, just thinking about the description of the beer and, you know, going with the blonde. And it just, again, the, the color scheme is just like right on the money. Um, so I feel like, I mean, kudos on both the beer and the design to both of you, um, just because that's what's kind of hitting me uh, and why I picked this piece. Um, this work is in our Modern and Contemporary collection. It is on view right now, so you can come and see it. Um, and what's great is like you can get the beer, you know, so you can come look at this work and then go right into um, our cafe um, and grab a hoppy blonde or do it vice versa, either which way. Um, as I mentioned, it's by Donald Sultan, who um, is known for these oversized um, works. This is, this is huge. I mean, I, I would say it's probably, oh my gosh, like, two of me stacked on top of one another. So 10 feet tall, maybe. Yeah, not very tall. So um, five and a half, but it's big, it's big. So it's, it's very, um, it has a huge presence in the gallery um, by its size, but I think also what it depicts, you know, it's a very enlarged um, still life basically um, of three lemons. So you can kind of see one lemon up top and it overlaps with this lemon here and another lemon here. And it's as if we were kind of hovering over top of the lemons, sort of looking down. And kind of right behind, if you see sort of this arc shape that goes, there's like an arc here, an arc at the bottom, and an arc on the left is actually the plate that the lemons are sitting on. So sort of like raising up there. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more about this, but I wanna um, tell you about um, the artist. So, this is Donald Sultan. He's got wine beside him, not beer, unfortunately, but, um, you know, I worked with what I got. Uh, so interesting guy. He was born in Asheville, North Carolina. So originally from the South um, and he went to UNC and then the Art Institute of Chicago. So um, really came of age in terms of graduate school and really with his honed it on his kind of style in Chicago. And actually had a different, completely different kind of look to his work, uh, focused more on kind of um, found objects, incorporating found objects into his work and, and really getting into um, expressive painting. Um, and this was at a time when minimalism was really kind of hitting it, um, but, and people were moving away more into sculpture than painting, but he really stuck with painting. Um, and then he moved in 75 to New York and to get started, you know, artists um, aren't rich and famous right off the bat, right? So he had to have a second job. Um, and he started renovating artist studios and started experiment, like incorporating his materials that he was working with in his renovation job into his art. So like working with, um, oh gosh, like, um, tar, you know, and different kind of sealants, you know, that we use on a floor or um, shavings from wood, you know, all of those things started to creep their way into his work and especially kind of the tar. Um, and that still is prominent in his work, even, even today in, in his paintings and something he's really well known for. And we'll talk about how that pops up in our, in our lemons painting. But how he started focusing on um, still life. So before he was doing kind of scenes of like factories or, or urban landscape scenes. Um, and then he went to a, a exhibition of Manet at the Met. 
and was really struck by his still life work specifically of lemons. So this is an example of Edward Manet, an impressionist artist, French impressionist artist. Um, this is from 1880. And he just started thinking about what could the still life mean in modern art? Like, how do I take this idea um, and translate it right into more um, kind of readability, you know, and at that time, um, in the, in the early 80s, so like 83, 84 is when he starts experimenting with this idea of, of the still life. And one thing that you all said kind of at the top and thinking about, you know, letting, kind of stripping everything else away, right? And really focusing on kind of what the beer is, the reason for the beer and, and letting that speak for himself. That's what Sultan is doing, right? He's, he's stripping away everything else and letting that object he's focusing on, in this case, a lemon, do the talking, right? It's just, it's just about that. So I just love that, that correlation too, with, with how you all are kind of your philosophy behind your brewery. You know, you're like Donald Sultan. You can just say that, you know, um, I would well, say, I mean, really, it's true. <laughs> I don't know if he'll like that, but in my opinion, I mean, it's, it's kind of the same process, right? That he's kind of, kind of doing. Um, we'll see the case of Hobby Blonde and see what he thinks. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. Um, and just another example of his work, again, just to give you, I like to give context and, and kind of show what else he's, he's working on. He's also really famous for working with flowers. So another still life um, sort of traditional motif that happened, that has happened like since the beginning of still life, which is really around in, in Dutch painting um, or like a Vanitas painting. But again, he's just like stripping that way, way down to the basics. And in this work, which is in the VMFA's collection, also on view in our 21st century gallery from 2004, he's still actively painting um, and, and kind of playing with these motifs and designs. Um, this is called 28 Colored Flowers. Um, so again, a really large scale work that you can see at the museum. Um, and then he also works in different medium. This is a charcoal drawing um, that he did and he dates all of his work usually. Um, so this was actually almost a year ago, May 31st, 2020, right in the middle of the of pandemic, right? Right when the pandemic started. Um, and so this is him processing kind of his emotions and, and working through that like we all were at that time. And some of us might still, still be doing that. Um, this is sort of his um, using the flower, the... Um, Camilla flower, which appears a lot in his work, and then just kind of um, uh, distorting it a little bit, making it a little smoky or fuzzy and kind of playing with that charcoal. And then over laying over top these circles, which circles as a motif appears in his work quite often. Um, and then he, he talks about these sort of circles representing kind of viewing the work through tears. So, I mean, it's, it's a very emotional work. Um, and I think a lot of his kind of, uh, some of his other work in the past few years have really become, again, kind of reverting back to landscapes um, and looking at the urban landscape again. And, and so, um, but still using that same kind of material. So a lot of tar or, um, um, and scraping of paint and things like that layering. Um, so while on the, on the subject matter is really stripped down, his process is very, um, intricate, right? And it's, and it's um, involved, a very involved process. Oh, Audrey has asked, what is flock? Flock, okay, yes. So flock is kind of um, a fabric. So um, if you think about um, velvet, kind of that um, raised sort of um, uh, really, really tight weave almost, it's, um, and then it's sort of not as smooth as, vel as velvet, but a little um, little coarser, if that makes sense. So kind of in between um, kind of a flat fabric and a velvet, you kind of get a coarser kind of flocked material. Um, almost like um, if you have like a, um, those old school like deers and Christmas ornaments, um, uh, it's like, a, I don't know, I'm, I'm maybe probing from a personal experience that no one else has, I don't know. Um, or uh, 
like a like an um, little miniatures that maybe have a fabric covering and it's 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 sort of um, abrasive, a little abrasive and a little soft in between that. That's kind of flack. Yes, like felt. Yes, a little bit coarser than felt. Thanks, Denise. <laughs> a little texture. Yeah. So the flower. Yeah, it has a little bit of texture. And again, you see that tar. So the black is the tar, and he's probably. And I haven't seen this work in person, but it, you can sort of see the fuzziness. Um, in between the tiles. So each of this is actually made up of um, tiles. And the longer you look at this, you can start to see the, um, the lines in the tiles. So they're kind of squared tiles. And, and again, that's a nod to his work in construction. <laughs> no, can't touch it, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, so, his tile work, one, one time when he was like in, in another gallery, I guess, helping out, he was watching linoleum floors being installed in those tiles. And he got really intrigued with that process and thinking about things broken up into squares. And again, that starts to creep into his work. And still today, you know, 30 years later, he's still exploring, exploring that idea in terms of canvas construction. And that happens in this one too. So if you can see kind of if everyone can, the, um, the lines that delineate, right, the four canvases that actually make up this full canvas. Um, so it's four squares um, compiled together. And I mentioned before kind of that stripping away and getting to that basic shape of the lemon. And actually what he does is to build up that canvas in this particular instance, he layered on that tar over the whole thing, over the four canvases. And then he scraped away the shape of the lemon and the shape of the plate and then painted it in. So he's he's kind of, it's almost like a relief sculpture in a way. So there's definitely, again, you know, anytime there's a relief in a, in a work of art and you're in the gallery, what something I always, I like to do and I encourage people to do is stand to the side of the work instead of face on. Cause then you can see that layer, that the layers being built up just, you know, 12 inches away is always, is all we encourage you to do. So don't get too, too close, but. I always say, and if I'm there, it's 12 inches from your painting and your and your speaker. <laughs> anyway, little joke for you, little museum humor. Um, so, so again, I, again, he's he's really taking this idea of a still life, which is a very traditional um, kind of genre in in art history, nodding back to predecessors, but completely flipping the script a little bit, um, and and really again getting to the essence of of this lemon these three lemons again like again which I feel like is just such a great vibe with this happy blonde and what you all are trying to do um, with your brewery so I, I mean what do you all think about this this work anybody in the audience too um, any questions but Mark and Patrick too I mean are you feel good with this pairing well I'm, I'm uh, immensely flattered to be, have <laughs> my name uh, our names mentioned in the same sentences as uh, so, um, looking at first work, I, um, I I get the electric flavor of lemon in the back of my mouth just looking at it. Yeah, it's so clear with such a simple graphic presentation. Um, it, it's incredible, and I, I I absolutely love it. And then I I think about how how he's working with what are ultimately industrial materials. He's working with enamel and masonite and butyl and, and these things that are, you know, very, very base sort of construction grade stuff, which yeah. uh, again relates to what, what, what Mark does because in a way brewing is a, is an industrial process. You, you take, you take grain, you take water, you take hops, you take, um, the, the yeast and you combine it into, into a, a sort of magical process to create this this, this beverage that's uh, somewhat transcendental. Mm -hmm. So looking at what Sultans has done with these uh, these these very kind of mundane materials yeah. that, that make you feel incredible looking at them, um, I can only think of what what Mark does with with his ingredients and, and making beverages that, uh, well, I, I, I hope achieve a, a similar height. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, again, next time you all are in Richmond, please, you know, stop on by and, and see it in person. Um, 
and let me know when you're coming. I'll say hi. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's let's uh, dig into the next the next selection, Perpetual Bloom. So again, if you're tasting along with us, you want to crack that open. I'm gonna do the same. So my it's got my favorite color on it. Orange is my favorite color. So I'm immediately happy. And I haven't even tasted it yet. Yeah, this is uh, it's actually one of my favorite labels of Patrick's. Patrick does all the label design and that's not, hasn't already been made clear. He does the graphic design and I do the liquid design. Um, <laughs> uh, and this is a house favorite beer, like a staff favorite beer of, our, of us and all the people that work for us. And by all the people, I mean like two or three, but <laughs> we love them so much if you're out there. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this is, uh, this beer was one that um, we wanted to approach. So we, we have a sort of our, our standard IPA is called Pattern Recognition, which um, was our first IPA to market uh, four years ago almost at this point, which we love. Uh, this was kind of the next time that I was allowed to just kind of do another one that I really wanted to do, you know, uh, knowing that that one was already established as kind of like the house IPA. Uh, and, and this one, we kind of um, flex out of the, the frame a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, primarily in this one, um, we focus on using uh, a hot bridle that's grown in uh, New Zealand, which we had not used any of the New Zealand hops up to this point uh, in IPAs. And uh, the New Zealand hops are very notable for their kind of um, like sort of stone fruit orchard. Um, not so, so we, we sort of associate like big citrus with like American hops and we associate kind of earthy grassy with European hops, but the New Zealand hops sort of came in and did like this other super weird like orchard stone food mm -hmm. kind of thing. And at the same time with this beer, um, as American IPAs were kind of becoming large, uh, German growers started cultivating hops in Germany that were supposed to be big citrus hops, mm -hmm. um, which from their point of view, they achieved fantastically. Uh, from my point of view, they may ended up creating these like really cool kind of hybrid varieties mm -hmm. where, so this one features Mandarina Bavaria primarily as a German hop, um, which uh, carries a, this strange kind of like citrus character, but also carries like a, a super traditional German noble character in with it as well. Um, and then uh, which is um, nicknamed the whole orchard, uh, which is kind of like lots of stone fruit, weird like peach kind of plum character, uh, sort of hop characteristics that we don't usually expect in, in, in a West Coast style IPA, which is what this one is. Um, we throw uh, equinox and citra on that as well here to sort of like ground it in that characteristic of a West Coast IPA. Um, and our uh, sort of this is the result, I guess, is the best way to put it. Um, from a name point of view, we, we sort of thought it'd be kind of a cool, uh, it, it always sort of felt like floral and like full of life and um, fruitier, a little bit different than so your typical like full citrus forward West Coast IPA. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I, I, for me again, like IPA, I, I always, I don't know. I don't know. I always find it like overbearing sometimes for me, for my palate. Um, but this like, again, is just so, I don't know, to me, like nicer <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, you know, it's not, again, like I don't, I don't, it's just so a lot more drinkable than other IPAs I've, I've tried. From a recipe development and construction standpoint, we generally, or and I, we, we approach IPA in general um, as trying to like dial back kind of the sharp edges, I guess. Yeah. Um, because in, in, in essence, an IPA, at least from our point of view, uh, is something that is like 
you know, it, it's it, it's explosive and interesting and and uh, like large and fun angles, but never like beyond the edge. Like you, we don't want ever want like we want like rounded down. We don't want sharp edges. Yeah, if that makes yeah. Sense. That's, like, it's not yeah. like it's not overly strong in alcohol. It's not like overly bitter. There's not like one flavor that's like it just blasting. Yeah. Over everything else. Like, we like to try to like round it out, make it balanced because like. Uh, I mean, we, we're both big IPA fans. We obviously mm -hmm. got into IPAs early on in craft beer, and I certainly enjoy a huge, crazy IPA. But when it comes to like what I want to drink, like more than you know half of one, <laughs> then it's something that like has all of the flavors that I love in an IPA. But it's something that like doesn't wear out your palate. It's something you can like have with a meal and and enjoy, and like yeah. does not direct your uh, your kind of sensory palate moving forward. So just curious if anyone is tasting along with us any any impressions of this one, you can pop it in the chat. And while we talk a little bit about again the logo here, the graphic on this one, um, you know, which the color is really focused around your logo, Patrick, and and it looks to me like a like a marigold flower, you know, kind of ripping off the idea of a bloom. So if you want to share kind of your thought process behind that. Yeah, I, I think you've, um, you've identified it uh, <laughs> uh, pretty quickly. You know, it's, it's, it's always a puzzle when, when Mark goes off on these riffs, he's, he's taking uh, so many diverse flavor profiles and blending them together into something that, that, that ultimately makes a cohesive uh, taste you know it's you, you capture it it's it's got that floral that citrus quality um it's got everything he wants in it and you know when i try to interpret it i i got something very springy about it i got something very uh fresh and new something that was you know all about um kind of rejuvenation and so when we started zeroing in on this beer um I wanted to do something that focused on spring. And so we sort of went a little bit back and forth about, you know, what, what it was, you know, is it, is it green blossoms? Well, it's not, it's not quite as grassy as that. It's something a little more um, kind of, kind of aged in, in the season. And so we, we looked at this, this idea of, you know, blooms coming back year after year and, and yeah, that, that kind of marigold look, the idea of uh, you know, a, a flower or something that's, that's coming back time and time again. And, and I, again, it's, it's, it's sort of a synesthetic response, but you know, when you, when you look at the color of the beer, yeah. it's so much down <laughs> on, yeah. Good, yeah, <laughs> you like, hit, yeah, I, I noticed but, that too. Yeah, by happy accident came, came almost exactly to be the, the yeah. color of the lake. Yeah, and that was a, a, a beautiful accident. Um, and so, you know, to me, this, this, this label feels like the beer tastes. And I, I think that's a great thing. Which is, a, it's a similar response to Hoppy Blonde. We were talking about, like, you look at a Hoppy Blonde label and you're like, I have a kind of good idea of what I'm getting into. And I feel yeah. like this label is the same thing, too, where you're like, yeah. I mean, I, this is, like I said, this is a favorite in the house. So like, yeah. I mean, that works yeah. for us. But you look at it on the shelf and you're like, yeah, that's going to be, I, I get an idea. It's like someone took an orange and went like, boom, mm -hmm. but it's also like floral and like, yeah. yeah, all of that. Yeah. Yeah, Denise is, is sharing. It's very nice and she's enjoying it a lot. It's great to hear. I am too. I mean, really, like I usually IP, I'm like, mm, but, I, but I just poured more. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> um so speaking of perpetual bloom um and i'm oh my gosh it's 6 14 i gotta i gotta hurry this along i mean you got you know you guys are fun to talk to so we're <laughs> we may be doing it being apologizing <laughs> so this this work um this work is called russian bank and it's by an artist named florian studheimer and you know i could do a whole talk on just her she is so cool and i i I mean, I've been doing art history for a really long time and I didn't know really anything about her. It's kind of one of the things that's really fun about my job is, is discovering new things, learning something new, you know, all the time. And I really try to do that. And if you don't know Florian Stedheimer, I'm telling you, you know, you've been sleeping. 
because she's she's really cool. Um, this work is the only work we have by her in the collection. It is currently not on view. Um, but to me, you know, when I thought about the name Perpetual Bloom, I wanted to find something that really reinforced this idea of, you know, a painting of, of flowers or blooms is, is, is like a perpetual bloom in itself. You know, that's, that's always going to stay around um, and always be, be blooming and, and bright, you know? Um, and that's kind of the feeling that I get from this work uh, by, by Florine. And it's really centered upon this still life. Again, sort of like, got a running theme here um, of the works we're looking at, um, with like the Sultan, which is a, a still life and really focuses in on that still life. You know, there's a lot of other things going on in this painting, but really the central part of that composition are these blooms, these flowers that are just kind of tilted on a table. So again, we're sort of looking down, right, at this perspective, um, and it's really taking up kind of our a whole eye. And, and there's not, you know, there's like, it's suggestions of different types of flowers. You know, if you were a botanist, I'm sure you could get in there and, and, and name name all the ones. But for me, you know, this flower here really resonates uh, with the label to me um, in the way that the flower is structured and it's a little orangey, orangey pink. Um, and we'll kind of come back to this in, in a little bit, but just again, I always try to give you a sense of who the artist was. So try to find an image of her. So this is her on the left from about 1914. She was born in 1871 in New York to a German, a Jewish German family and had kept those connections with Germany and they would travel back and forth. So she, they spent a lot of time in Munich um, and you know, made New York their home and went back and forth. Um, and she studied, studied art um, on the right is a self-portrait of her, um, herself and self-portrait. Um, when she was kind of first starting out. Um, very different style than what we just saw before. Um, kind of this painterly style and you, a little bit of realism here. Um, and she kind of hints back to the kind of that open brushwork. So in tradition of like John Singer Sargent or Velasquez, and that's kind of how she starts out. Um, and then she really starts with her two sisters, Carrie and Eddie. They form these salons and start hanging out with like Gertrude Stein and Marcel Duchamp, Alfred Stieglitz, Georgia O'Keeffe, and they just um, are really known for throwing these really cool get togethers. Um, and she becomes really a staple of that world, but yet we still, she's not as popular as O'Keeffe, you know, she's sort of not many people know about her and that's because she didn't exhibit very often. She was very private about her paintings. Um, but these are just, she focuses a lot on these like symbolists and these crazy colors, you know, kind of hearkening to some Van Gogh yellows, um, some Fovis pinks and, and, and blues. Um, this is called Picnic at Bedford Hills at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art. Um, again, a lot happening in this work, but it's all about being outside. So again, a nice connection back to what you all were talking about with this perpetual bloom and this orange colors to me really resonate with the color of the beer. Um, this figure here at the front in the purple suit is Marcel Duchamp. And this is uh, Florine here under a parasol. Um, that's usually her kind of calling card in, in work is, is being under a parasol. This is her other sister. So this is her sister Carrie with the lobster that Marcel Sal Duchamp is preparing. I don't know if you can see this little lobster here on her plate. And so he's, this is the lobster pot. Got a little feast going here. And this is her other sister, Eddie, um, hanging out on this, this carpet, talking to a friend. It's a very surreal kind of looking landscape. And she uses these bright colors a lot and these kind of live figures. Um, this work is Asbury Park South from 1920, pretty, pretty revolutionary for a white artist um, to depict um, a segregated beach. Um, but here she is here um, in her parasol, just kind of painted herself in. A couple of her friends are here. This is a detail image. And she's depicting African-Americans enjoying like just being at the beach and um, nicely like dress, like having a good time, like not, you know, um, being depicted in a derogatory way and, and actually paying attention to the range of skin tone. Um, so this is, this is kind of bringing to the forefront in 1920, 
um, marginalized, you know, people. And she's, she's very ahead of her time. You know, she's, she's a very progressive artist and, and person and really, really into this kind of um, progressive um, kind of uh, portion of, of society that's happening in New York. Um, again, just really cool to learn about this person. Um, another one of her famous paintings is from a series called Cathedrals of New York. This is Cathedrals of Broadway. Broadway. Again, we get that orange color, those kind of bright reds um, to me that really resonate with that, with the tone of, of your beer. Um, and then coming back to this work, which is again, a little more subdued than we just saw, but those bright colors are right in the center. And this is actually a family portrait. Um, so this is the artist here. She's walking out of the garden uh, with her, looks like a cat maybe, another cat here or a dog. This is um, one of her sisters here, Eddie, who's just reading a book. Um, and then her mother here and her other sister, Carrie, and they're playing a solitaire game. And that game is called Russian Bank. So that's what the title of the painting is referring to. It's actually not in Russia, um, but in their kind of summer home um, in, in New York. So again, these blooms are just always going to be there. Um, and also another thing that she shares with Donald Sultan is kind of this, this layering method of her work. So she kind of, she layered on um, white um, called kind of Chinese white, referring to the white color of Chinese porcelain. So very, very white. And then she would layer tinted color on top of that. Again, kind of building up that layer and then scrape or, or move the paint off um, to create that sense of depth and texture. So another, another thing that she share, shares with, Dave, with Donald Sultan. So again, if you're sleeping on Florine Stedheimer, look her up. She's really, really cool. Again, I could just like nerd out on her uh, a lot, um, but I just, I love the way she, her treatment of flowers and this idea of, of blooming um, that really appears in a lot of her work. Um, so we're gonna, Hop over to our, our last selection, um, The Unreasonable. I'm gonna drink, I know, I've gotta drink this one, hold on. <laughs> you don't have to, we'll make more. Yeah. <laughs> so this one, very different look than the other two that we just saw. Um, and I know there's a great story behind the look, but also the beer and when it comes out on an annual basis, so. Tell us, tell us the, the Jan. Well, as ever, we should start with beer. So many things here. Yeah. Um, so uh, we touched briefly, Patrick primarily is the best at explaining why we're called Reason Beer. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate him being here. He lives in Los Angeles. So this is a rare show. Oh, whoa. That's so, um, oh gosh. Uh, I would say, so when we sort of landed on the name Reason Beer, I would say somewhere between 15 and 20 seconds after that, we decided that once a year we would make a beer called Unreasonable and release it on April Fool's Day and with no other information. Like, <laughs> we literally like oh, that sounds good. Also, we'll do this. And, uh, and so it fell to me uh, to be like, well, what's that going to be? Yeah. Uh, in, in, in a hilarious way. And so um, if we're going to get into the weeds on IPA, which we we're getting there, right? Um, for, for over 10 years at this point and the New England style IPA like the hazy IPA the juicy fruity hazy IPA is a style that like I never really got into personally um, it seems that a lot of people are into it and not me um, but the, the, the concept here is that we would do one of these once a year and we would call it a reasonable this is where we got into because um, the name of the brewery is reason and unreasonable obviously is opposite of what we do. Um, so we did a hazy IPA, which is a New England style IPA. Um, so I'll go into the beer part of it. Uh, the way that this is accomplished, um, you want like a basically non-existent bitterness and a big like tropical fruitiness um, is sort of the hallmark of the New England style IPA. Um, so we've done this each year on April Fool's Day, uh, the last two years to package. So this is the fourth year of doing Unreasonable, which still blows my mind, like, for real. Um, 
And so uh, the beer itself is a very low bitterness, high fruity tropical uh, hazy style IPA. Another one, much like Perpetual Bloom, where it's like it's not uh, it, it, it's not like unapproachable. It's very drinkable, um, perhaps dangerously so at eight and a half percent alcohol. Um, but uh, the beer itself, uh, this also features some New Zealand hops. This uh, features Matueka, which is uh, both a region in New Zealand and also a hop variety name of New Zealand uh, hops as well. And <clears throat> um, when we threw this to Patrick uh, for design, it was a fun, I, I, I would like to hope for you, an extra fun design challenge because uh, we, we go out of our comfort zone in terms of liquid on this one. And we basically gave Patrick the, uh, the free reign to do what is completely out of the range of what we do design-wise. Yeah, so I, I, I think Mark had a good point that when you, um, when you set up a, a set of rules for yourself, uh, <laughs> design-wise or recipe-wise, um, it, can, it can be very um, fulfilling. You, you, can, uh, you can work within those boundaries and you can create new things that are very um, expressive and creative. But then to allow yourself the freedom to take those rules and flip them on their head once a year, um, that that gives us unreasonable. So for Mark, he can take again working within you know the, the boundaries we sort of set as a brewery, you know, continuing to maintain the balance in the beers and the the, uh, the smoothness that he's known for. He can create a beer that you know blows out all of the other uh, sort of uh, qualitative measures. Uh, of a beer so, um, whereas we have these very simple you know clear uh, reason beer logos and everything else unreasonable can be something completely different and uh, you know for me for uh, 2020 2021 it was this uh, to go from a, a white can to a completely black can that was uh, you know uh, printed in, in the wrong direction and, and broken up in a place in a way that was uh, almost impossible to read. <laughs> so you have this beer that's kind of wild and fun and it's it's still very visible on a shelf, but uh, but it's a little bit challenging and it's it's a little bit off the wall. And um, I, I think it is a, it's still a delicious beer. It's it's very much on the other side of, of what we think reason is. Um, but we're glad that a lot of people are enjoying it and are, are having fun with it. This, it's an April Fool's joke, and as long as everybody enjoys it in good spirit, then it's 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 a great thing. Yeah, no, we, I mean, it, it is an April Fool's joke, but it's a beer that like we worked hard to like put together, <laughs> and uh, it, it is contrary to like kind of our entire approach, but we love it, and it's kind of our weird uh you know i don't know it's our it's our it's it's one of our weird like offshoots well we we, we in this project at, at reason beer we've set up a uh, a certain number of boundaries for ourselves you know the, this this passion for balance mm -hmm. for for creating beers that have qualities that we we all appreciate and and aesthetically in the labels to have a um something that people can identify across the board and then to be able to just you know take a, a, a moment in april and completely break that down and do something counter to that mm -hmm. um that, that's a lot of fun for us yeah, yeah. it's released on all sides well it's it's i mean i am getting like tropical vibes off of this i mean pineapple yeah. kind of smacks me right i mean it's, it's good <laughs> It's it's good. It's really good. I, I'm kind of wondering if anyone else is getting a pineapple taste on that or tropical. If anybody wants to drop that in in the chat. Um, and you know, yeah, April Fools is like either. if you're in on the joke, it's super fun. Yeah, so I we feel like we're in on that. And it's it's basically the same, but we change it here and there. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's basically the same every year. Mm -hmm. 
maybe. maybe so maybe, do you maybe, all maybe. do sort of a limited like run of this in terms of quantity or, or like, um, I'm going to mess up this like term. I know the terminology for this, a small batch. Is that right? It's uh, I would say it's a pretty big small batch. It's okay. a limited release, yeah. uh, but we found, you know, now four years in that, you know, people get a kick out of this. They, they, they like seeing what we do as recent beer. And then when we, you know, kind of, uh, uh, shirk the restraints and do something counterintuitive. They like that too. So yeah. we, we make a good amount of it. Mm -hmm. So speaking of counterintuitive, we're gonna pop on to the the work that we select that I selected for this. Like, which again hits all those uh, those buttons that we just kind of talked about, but just in a work of art. So this is free sample take one by Descott Evans, American artist working in the eighteen late eighteen hundreds. Uh, early, early 19, yeah, late 1800s. Um, and it's in the Trump Loy style, which means fool the eye. So it's, it's a great connection with April Fool's Day. And the whole point of, of these, of course, is to make you think you're saying something you're not. Um, so kind of goes against um, kind of traditional painting in a way, but, but it actually goes, this is a tradition in painting that goes back again a couple of centuries. Um, and to Scott Evans, really interesting guy um, and painter. And again, we're gonna kind of get into this um, a little in a little bit. You can see the free sample take one little sign. Um, I've kind of blown it up. So it's a little bit easier to read, still a little fuzzy. Um, to Scott Evans here is pictured on the left, loving the hair, very kooky. Um, so Another thing he kind of has in common or this work has in common is it's very against what he usually does, right? So he's kind of like, like, like this unreasonable beer sort of is on the opposite end of what he usually does. And it usually does is, is depicted here. This is called the connoisseur, which is in the private collection. And he kind of made a living off of doing painting things like Victorian period, you know, very like the fabric, very sumptuous of, of ladies, um, maybe their commission works or things that we're going to sell. Um, and he was, he was uh, born in um, the Midwest in Indiana and practiced a lot in Cincinnati and Cleveland, went to Paris for a year and studied with William Bouguereau, who was like known for this kind of quality of work um, and like in interiors and things like this. So for him to kind of completely switch to a still life, um, that a Trump Loy still life is just totally different genre, right? Um, a complete surprise, um, and even more surprising. And you know, it's 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 kind of um, back and forth in kind of the art history world of why he did this. Um, but a lot of people theorize that he did these for fun. He did it for himself. You know, he wasn't getting paid or commissioned to do these Trump Loy works. It's sort of just like having a good time, trying something new, trying something different. And um, he actually used a pseudonym for these signatures. So on the left is an example from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, signed S.S. David. So it's like a play on his name. Um, sometimes he would sign them to Scott Evans, like in the one on the right from the Nelson Atkins Museum. Um, and again, these are still lives. Um, so on the right, we have fruit hanging and on the left, um, looks like almonds possibly, or maybe pecans. Um, and he, his real name actually was David Scott Evans. And he truncated the first two names, first, his first and middle names into Scott, De Scott, when he was in France, um, you know, to sound more European. Um, and then again, just kind of played around with that name, um, almost like fooling, right? Fooling the buyer the viewer again so it's like a double double fool double gotcha um in these in these paintings um and this is a tradition that would continue on with other artists this is uh by john petto from a private collection depicting the same subject but i feel like not as convincing as to scott evans in terms of depth and um cheek kind of and and the cheek or, or play here and again in, in that other image kind of this is a canvas, a frame around a canvas. So we'll kind of pop back to this one. 
So you can see kind of the jagged edges here at the bottom of the frame and at the top of the frame, that's the frame. And so the painting itself is within this rectangle. So he's actually painted the canvas, this kind of square or rectangle part to look like wood. But then the frame itself is actually wood. So again, it's kind of like this like a trick within a trick within a trick. Um, again, in person, there's a lot to unpack <laughs> and kind of investigate as you look at the surface of this painting. Um, and the other thing that's really, you know, I, I kind of going to ask or pose this to you all and, and those in the audience, like it says free sample take one, but let's look closely a little bit. Would you do it? Like, would you walk up to this, you know, if it was an actual stack of peanuts and take one? To put your hand Anybody? in the glass, maybe yeah. no. Yeah, it's, it looks pretty dangerous. I don't, I don't know if I would, I mean, this is, again, he's painted, the skill in this is like mind boggling. I mean, he's painted a, um, a piece of, a pane of glass that has been cracked and broken. So it's kind of like he's daring you to do it. Yeah. So like, hey, free sample, take one. Are you gonna do it? Um, so if you stuck your hand in there, you could get cut. And if you, if you took this peanut, this peanut here, that's sort of like protruding into our space, um, if you pulled that out, everything else would come tumbling out. So like, you wouldn't just be taking one, like you're by accident, you'd, you'd ruin everything. <laughs> so, so, I mean, there's, yeah, yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> so it, um, I mean, it's a very successful fool the eye painting and a great April fool's joke. Yes. in a lot of ways a lot of layers here a lot of like hidden kind of gotcha jokes i mean he must have been really i don't know a really fun person to be around um to to think of something like this and again goes i feel like just goes really well um with kind of the spirit of unreasonable it's not you know there's no peanut taste in here but we did talk about this would go good with peanuts right not this go year go for it here yeah <laughs> Uh, um, so again, check out to Scott Davis or uh, Scott Evans, um, they actually on Antiques Roadshow, one of his works showed up a couple of years ago. So you can check out that clip. It was of apples. Um, and again, I mean, I think all three of these really have that still life component, um, in them by three great American artists, um, that really span, um, you know, uh, a couple centuries, uh, which is also really cool and kind of could keep that thread. Um, so I want to, you know, we've, we've actually gone over time because you guys are just fun to talk to and we really uh, enjoyed exploring your beers um, and the works with you. And again, really appreciate you spending time with us and all of you out there um, on the webinar. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Sampling Reason Beer. Hopefully, you know, if, if you already knew them, you enjoyed it. And if you didn't know them, now you do. And we'll visit them out in Charlottesville because you all are open for your tasting rooms open and you know as we kind of ease restrictions in Virginia. Yeah, yeah we're Wednesday through Sunday right now. Yep. And op opening further soon, hopefully. Great. So definitely check it out. And like they said, you can get if you're in Virginia, get this beer pretty much anywhere. And of course you can get it at VMFA. So um uh thank you again. Um, and I'd welcome everyone to join us for the next taste of our programs presented by Chase. On June 9th, uh, we will go back to wine and um, look at rosé to an example from California and an example from Fran France. And we'll be looking at works of art where pink is the predominant color scheme so we can complement the, uh, the traditional color of rosé. And then on June 25th, we'll be um, checking in with Lost Rhino Brewery out in, uh, from Northern Virginia area. And looking okay. again at American American artists. So um, yes, thanks everyone. Have a great Memorial Day long weekend. And again, Patrick and Mark, thank you so much uh, for spending time with us. I really enjoyed your beers. And um, oh, June 9th's not a Friday. Uh oh, Denise is keeping me straight here. Hold on, let me make sure I've got my. Oh, June 11th. Sorry about that, Denise. Good catch. I'm gonna fix that. Um, June 11th. Thank you. I think I had something else on my mind for the ninth. <laughs> but again, Mark um, and Patrick, thanks again. 
and Perfect. hopefully we'll see you at the museum sometime soon or at your at your brewery so have a good night everybody thank you bye-bye thank you